Hello, and welcome to the first ever episode of Kansas Ed Talk. My name is Marcus Baltzell, and I'm the host and will act as the moderator for today's discussion. The purpose of Kansas Ed Talk is to bring together diverse voices in order to have an open and honest discussion about public education in Kansas today. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to register for our public education advocacy platform. By registering as an advocate, you are demonstrating that you care about public education in Kansas. Through the advocacy platform, you will be notified via text alerts anytime policy or news impacting public education breaks. And you will be given an opportunity to act immediately. You can register right now at www.joinusks.org. Again, that's www.joinusks.org. Today's show is titled Common Ground. Where can we find common ground within the often contentious education debate? Today's panelists include Representative Melissa Rooker, a Republican from District 25 in Johnson County, Kansas, Tom Brungard, a school board member from Junction City, Kansas, David Shawner, General Counsel for the Kansas NEA, and I'd like to hear first from our final panelist, a teacher from right here in Topeka, where she also serves as the president of NEA Topeka, Stephanie Harson. Stephanie, maybe you can enlighten us a little bit on what the, the modern classroom reality is and, and where we might start this discussion regarding some common ground around public education. Stephanie. What I would start with is Kansas has a history of valuing public schools and valuing public education. I think that that, with the everyday Kansan, has not changed. We still have students coming wanting something out of it, whether they want to um, later become an artist or they want to become a scientist. Even our kindergartners understand that school is a road to something else, something bigger and better and brighter for their future. Their parents, their grandparents, aunts and uncles, family understands that as well. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't matter what zip code you're in, what race or class you come from. People value public schools because they understand that's kind of like your admission ticket to something else. And I don't think that that has changed. The challenges that we face in the classroom have changed, but that common value has not changed. I have an aunt who began her teaching career in rural Douglas County in a one-room schoolhouse. And what that community valued as public education as a gate to something else, I don't think is any different than what we have in our 21st century classrooms now. So value is, is obviously a common shared you know, trait, I think, that all Kansas, Kansans have. So, Melissa Rooker, in Johnson County, what, what would you, how would you speak to this, this topic a little bit? Well, I, I don't, I'm one who doesn't believe it matters where in the state you hail from. I think we all want the same thing, which is that that opportunity for our children to learn and succeed. And I think what we see is, a, a, you know, this question was asking us to focus on what factors we think most impact that teacher-student learning relationship. I think we have a growing number of students coming from backgrounds where home life is stress. You've got a lot of people thrown out of work and, and struggling to make it in an economy that is slow to recover in the state for a variety of reasons. Um, you have teachers, and, and I, I'm a believer, whether you're talking union or not, teachers are under attack in this state. And so it, it, I think that throws some barriers in between that learning relationship. And what, what you need are children who come ready to learn and teachers who feel valued and uh, want to be there to giving their best. And, and it creates a trusting relationship that I, it is the key to success. You're almost kind of speaking to this idea that we want them to want to come to class. Well, you know, I think and, it's very true. Yeah. And there are kids who need to have the stability that the school day provides from the, the meals that, that – they have at school to some of the wraparound care and we get a lot of pushback about why in in the public school Mm -hmm. arena we're supposed to provide those things it just i think it's 
it's simply the reality today that, that there are kids with tremendous needs walking through the doors of our schools. Public schools have historically been the place that every child is welcome. And we need to address their needs so that they can sit down and take care of the business at hand, which is learning. Well, and you're, you're kind of speaking to this idea of equality. And it re reminded me that, you know, in, in the districts that had to cut their calendars a little bit last year, you know, for some kids that meant Three, three more days meant three more days without maybe breakfast or lunch. Absolutely. And that's just the reality in their homes. And their for homes. working parents, that's th three more days. They, they need to scramble to find someone to care for their kids last minute. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a whole host of issues that come with, with that kind of, of sudden shift in the calendar. Right. So I think at heart, funding is, is certainly the, the, the biggest barrier in the way of, of all of it. I think it in, informs all of the different aspects of the conversation. Well, and I think the reality is that is a common ground issue. Funding is a common mm -hmm. ground issue. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Brungart from Junction City, in that perspective, now you have, you have a population that might have some maybe some transients to it because you serve the base there, people moving in and out, going different places. What do you see in Junction City? We have that unique situation where we have uh, schools in Fort Raleigh where we have a teacher that might start out with 25 kids in the class and end up with 25 kids in the class and the 25 different kids from the beginning of the school to the end of the school. So we have this huge transition problem there. We also have a huge poverty problem as, we would, as we've been talking about. I heard a heartbreaking story this morning about a kid who, in the after-school program, uh, Panera Bread brings some stuff over for the kids uh, at the Boys and Girls Club. And he was given, this kid was given a, a loaf of bread, and he said he was going to take it home and, and hide it in his bedroom for himself. Uh, that's how deprived uh, he is. Uh, despite that, these kids do want to come to work, do, do, go, do want to come to school, they want to, they want to learn. They recognize that as a, as a way out of whatever poverty they're in. Uh, at the same time, uh, they already have some skills that the rest of us don't have. You mean kind of with, with, their, with the nature of their... Yes. They, they are not uh, unintelligent. They, they can learn given the opportunity, given the right set of incentives. Because they, they already have survived in a world that I would have trouble surviving in. Well, speaking of that, you know, it sounds like we're, we're kind of, I, I was kind of um, not afraid, but I, I kind of predicted that this question would lead us down the road, maybe not of, of common ground uh, positions that, of positivity necessarily, but maybe some common ground issues. And it sounds like we're coming back to this, this poverty and equality and funding issue time and again. So, so David Chandra, from your perspective, now, uh, you're general counsel for Kansas NEA, so, so you work with a lot of teachers. You, you hear a lot of different things that go on throughout the state. Um, are, are we talking in the right vein here when we talk about common ground issues? Are there some com Is there some other common ground that we can talk about here? Well, I, I think the common ground, that, uh, as I was listening to what people were saying, and I, I frankly, I agree with everything I heard, I, th I think there's a certain mythology at work here. I think the mythology is one that comes out of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, when I was in school, I mean, not the 40s, but <laughs> some of those uh, decades. We can't edit that part out. <laughs> yeah. no, that's, that's okay. Uh, the mythology is that if you, that uh, you're going to have a, a, a two-parent family and the father will work and the mother will have dinner on the table and the kitty goes to school and they'll, he or she will graduate from high school and go to college and become successful. That mythology is is um, is challenged today. Uh, it's challenged by the, the lack of the, the increasing number of single parent families. The, the the reality that a whole lot of kids wouldn't eat if they didn't go to school. The reality that public the public's opinion of public education as an entity. Is, has suffered while they still like their local school and they like their local teacher, uh, the question really isn't so much what's our common, what are the com things we have in common, but how can we figure out what it is we really want to rally around and support both with our interest, our time, and our money. Uh, you can't run schools with bake sales. 
although that's a common mythology. You know, if you just have enough bake sales, you can have new uniforms and you can do this and that and the other thing. Well, it's, not, it's a nice add-on, but the truth of the matter is the common theme now is underfunding public schools. And we see that every day in the work that I do where teachers are trying to make a living in one of the locals that I'm working with now, they have a flex time issue. They can leave, the teacher can leave 10 minutes before the regular day, and they need to do that, many of them, to go to a second job. I mean, th th that's, the, that's the reality. That's the commonality, if you will. And I, I, I hate to, uh, again, all the, the nice things we say about what schools do and kids want to learn and all the rest of that is all true, but let's break down the mythology and talk about the reality of uh, whoa, teachers, kids, parents, legislators deal with on Is part of that Go ahead. is part of that um, climate as a result of I think among some people uh, in high up government want to do away with the public schools, that their their goal is to uh, privatize education. Is it privatized education or is it profitized education? I mean, which well, is which is more? Well, the, and the profit is absolutely correct. And if you talk with some of the legislators, it is they will talk about you know those kids over there, and they have this idea that um, public education, you know, that somehow our our students um, from low income families, from um, our more diverse communities or somehow some kind of drain on the public education system. And we've talked a lot about the challenges of educating kids in poverty. But the reality is, right now, public education, even in some of our wealthier communities, is struggling to fund those schools adequately and to educate those children. In our rural communities, the bus rides are longer, the class sizes are larger, and the number of electives and um, academic opportunities have decreased. So it really doesn't matter where in our state you are right now. Nobody is sitting pretty. The reality is it's a challenge for everyone, and that's common ground. Um, when we talk about bake sales and things like that, I have a little anecdote. We were adopted at my little school last year. We had about between 250 and 300 students every year. We were adopted by a local church, the entire church congregation, took on our school, they would come in and volunteer, and what they told us August 18th was they did not want any teacher to have to buy anything out of pocket the rest of that year. They were going to help with our supplies that were not, um, that were not able to be funded by the school supply budget. By October 1st, this school, this church congregation came to our school and very humbly and embarrassedly stated that they were they had maxed out the ability of their congregation to help us and that they were not going to be able to fund any more requests at least for the next several months. Mm. They would come and they would volunteer, they would give us their people power, but they, they did not have the, the funds to continue to help us. And they were buying things like extra pencils and erasers. It's not like they were buying computers for our school. So the reality is one more bake scale, one more church congregation, the money isn't there to fund the level that our 21st century schools need to be funded. Well, let me frame this. I, I make a, a point of attending PTA meetings for the schools I represent. I, um, in my, my district is 20 square blocks. We are a, a dense, densely populated area. I have a, a school PTA that raises their, their budget. I was there for the budget approval meeting. That They have $200,000 flowing through their budget because of the amount of supplemental aid they provide to their school. I also have a, a, these are both elementary schools, I also have a school in the district that cannot raise enough money to simply pay the, the required insurance costs for their PTA unit. So that's the disparity, that's the microcosm of my little district. Can you imagine statewide the differences that we're dealing with? And, and, and it occurs to me the districts that don't have the capacity to raise that kind of revenue, you know, kind of from the bake sales and, and mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things, you know, um, there's a, the district and my kids go to school in, you know, uh, PTA is raising money for new projectors in the classroom. But the question has to be asked, 
why is PTA raising that money? Is that a resource, an educational resource that the state needs to be providing? One of the things I experienced growing up is I'm a product of Catholic schools. I went to uh, Catholic schools from first grade through senior in high school. And we were raising money all the time. And I figured once I became a teacher, I taught for 31 years, once I became a teacher in the public school system, that was all going to be behind me. And it isn't. No. It's, it's a fundamental part of the public education system, uh, and I don't think it should be. Well, part, part of the, the, the increasing pressure on public schools is that the public school is now the common, the, the place where society has placed expectations beyond the, through the reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's special education, it's medical, uh, de delivery of medical services, it's um, transition to work programs, it's computer literacy skills, it's breakfast, it's lunch, it's all those things which cost money. And if someplace else in the society can't fix it or do it, well, let's have the public schools do it. And there are a lot of mandates from the federal government, other mandates from the state government, about and, and mandates from citizens in, within school districts. We want this for our kids. And the funding stream for those requests or requirements are just not there. Federal government has been very poor. They make big promises and then they ne never deliver. You know, they were going to fund special ed at 40%. I don't think they've ever gotten close to 40% and not likely to as at going forward. So w when you add the community's expectation load on a public school and that school isn't properly funded, what results is a lot of frustration among faculty members. They're working longer, they're working harder, they're expected, some of them, to have an IEP for every kid in the school. So if you have 30 or 40 students, you have an individual education program for each of those students. It, in many ways, you might as well just take them home with you. Well, let me add to that because there's another level, and it's when our kids get into the, the high school level. We are now expecting schools to prepare for specific careers, not just make them, you know, the high school diploma means College they're ready, ready to yeah. launch, but, but you know, these the, the all these programs to, for career certification programs, that's something that the private sector used to do through apprenticeships and, and those training programs that, that the, the workforce used to ha develop. And so now it's on our school system. So that that, that comes with the cost. You, you just can't keep adding to the scope of what the schools are expected to do without acknowledging the rising costs of it. Well, and it seems like, you know, we know that um, in the last several years, poverty has increased in this state. We ta all talked about it at the table so far today. Um, and, you know, it, it all kind of leads back to this idea that, you know, an impoverished child, a child in need, is going to end up in a classroom and is going to end up in front of a teacher. And and that, that individual child may have, in, and well, in fact, does have individual need that that teacher is going to be expected to, um, you know, attenuate to. And so, Stephanie, before you leave, because you have to leave a little bit early, I want you to speak to that a little bit. Those, those individual needs that you see arising out of, as, as Melissa Rooker said, we talked about home life, we talked about, you know, this kind of transience. How does that translate into the classroom, and what, what kinds of impacts does that have in the classroom? Well, it has a number of significant impacts. Um, what I have seen that we also need to kind of keep in perspective is at the same time that more pressures have fallen on our public schools, funding and support for our schools has decreased, but funding and support for community-based services from the state has also decreased. Those waiting lists for services are longer and longer. When I first began teaching, it was, you know, maybe a few months, and you would talk to a parent about these are some supports and services you can get at the home. The waiting list is a few months, but you'll get them by the end of the year. Let's start applying now. Now, you know, I talk to them and I say, well, at last I heard the list was three years long. Let me interrupt you for a second because you just said something really important. It sounds like that in your conversations with parents, 
you're not just you're not just coaching them on what's going on with their child. You're actually helping them get resources in the community. And right. do you feel like teachers have to? You know, that's an impact that teachers face. You know, they have to. It's kind of like you know when you, when you go on an airplane trip, the stewardess says if the oxygen mask comes down, the parent right. has to take the breath in order to save the child. Right. Is it kind of the same concept? Well, here's here's where I've, I'm I'm at as far as a classroom teacher, as a special education teacher. I need my students to learn. I need them to be successful. There are certain skills and concepts that they need to master by the end of the year. I look at them and I say, this is what you've got. These are your strengths. These are your challenges. What's standing in the way of you getting where you need to be by the end of the year? One child, it was that they were chronically late to school. And so I talked to them about how to set their own alarm clock. You're in fourth grade, you're 10, you have a cell phone. It doesn't, you know, it's just a phone, but you plug it in, you charge it to play a game. It has an alarm on it. Let me show you how to set that alarm so that you can get up the next day and be at school. Now, in the meantime, I'm working with parents and talking to them. Sometimes it's that the mom is working two jobs and she's sleeping between 2 and 7 a.m. and, you know, and trying to get up and get on time and get them to school on time. But the reality is whatever challenge my students are facing that's in the way of their learning is something that I work with both them and with their parents to try to help them be successful. The student, it was an alarm clock. Maybe another student, it's school supplies. Um, maybe it's how to um, help them learn to sit in class or you need to go and run five laps before you can come back in and you're going to be focused and calm and have all that nervous energy out and ready to focus and learn. I'm just going to sleep after I'll be dead. Maybe it's mental health needs and that the students have experienced some kind of trauma. We find in our district in particular right now, we have a lot of students who have experienced some kind of trauma and um, they, they need help to be able to deal with those mental health issues so that they can focus and learn. The reality is that there are all kinds of challenges out there. What I see is, you know, quite honestly, the miracle is not that our students have challenges um, to their learning, but honestly that most of the time our kids are successful. I mean, that's the miracle of all of this with more and more expectations put on our teachers with longer and longer hours, with less and less funding, somehow we still get the job done. What we fear is that that job is getting harder and harder and people are taking on second jobs, etc. And we just wonder how close we are to the point where this house of cards that we're trying to keep standing is going to fall. And that's what we're worried about. You no, know, one of the things you said reminded me, um, I was in a conversation with a couple of social workers a few years ago and they were talking about adult learning needs adults who don't know how to set an alarm or can't get to work on time or they have an appointment with their doctor at 10 in the morning and they take the whole day off where they're an hourly employee and that they need the right. money but they don't seem to recognize that they can go back to work right these the kids that are in school now that are facing these challenges in many cases, in too many cases, are the children of parents who suffer from the same thing. And right. so what we end up with is generational challenges, the depth of which seem to be getting a bit deeper as we move forward. So if, in fact, the schools are going to continue to be the thing and place that fixes everything, then that's, if, that's the, if that's the mantra going forward. And we need to have a big time out because that's simply not going to work. I see too many instances every day where that, despite best efforts, isn't a, a path to success. There was even a bill, I think, introduced in the legislature last year that schools had to teach kids how to shake hands. Yes. Oh well, yeah. Let, let, yeah. That yeah. was that was actually not last. It was a couple years, years ago. ago. And I and I, I remember thinking at the time, what's the final exam for that? You know. It, that was introduced to. It was strictly to make a point about yeah. the. It was an amendment to an underlying yeah. bill to make the point that. Yeah. yeah really. Or, yeah. I I, I, yeah. I recognize the point, but and it, but it gets back to what the what the state board of education is now dealing with. What should be the purpose of education? And more and more, it looks like they want the schools to focus on what we call soft skills, mm -hmm. the shaking of hands, the being on time, the being able to get to work 
the dedication, uh, that sort of thing, as opposed to the academics. And I'm sort of I'm sort of split on that on that field because I I, I believe those should be the sort of the byproduct of education more as the, more than the product of education. Well, I think it can go hand in hand with with the the academic side and and success in the realm of actually teaching our students. The, the the content the, the, exactly yeah. and and I, I think that it's really more about moving away from a single high stakes test at the end yes. of every year and mm -hmm. and integrating these skills more into project based learning and and all of these these uh, things that we can't do when we are focus solely on on the the test date and and making sure those kids have been prepped and ready to sit for that test. So I think it could be a very healthy move in the right direction. Um, and I, I, you know, I look at my own children who are 20 and 23 now, and so their entire K-12 experience really was in the era of no child left behind. And um, it, it looked very different than, than mine. And I think we have to get back to teaching the, the critical thinking skills and I think the soft skills come with that approach. Yeah. Do you think schools have ever taught critical thinking skills? I think they've been more free to a allow time for that, as opposed to the the repetitive drilling. I, you know, we had some. I, I can still rattle off the the linking verbs I learned in seventh grade <laughs> I, that had to be memorized. There are some you things you just. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Max would be proud. We have Mrs. Max There you has go. Oh my gosh, goodness. We can't get my mess up. We did this. There's, there's, you know, there was always. So you really could. <laughs> yes. that's, that's astounding. She really could, and she did. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, some things just have to be learned in that manner. But but we also, the same classroom, um, we ended up having some wonderful projects that we all got to engage in because of the, the freedom to delve into different units in a way that I, I didn't see happening with my kids going through. And, and you know, they got good quality education, but it... It, a different type, and and they've had to, as young adults, figure out some of those other skills that I think just came through naturally. You're, you're speaking of something that I was hoping this discussion would would a direction that it would go. And Stephanie, I think you have to make your leave. So we appreciate your time. Yes. Um, but but you know you're kind of talking about speaking of, of leaving a child behind. Um, you know. You're kind of going down this this road that we've heard that over the last few years with with the lack of resources, the lack of funding that that classrooms have seen, um, you know, we're kind of shortchanging our kids. I think and we are. and we've heard people say, you know, a third grader doesn't get a second chance to to be in third grade. And so the question now to the group is, what do we say to those parents and what do we say to those kids? They don't know that they've had a diminished. The teachers do everything they can to shield their kids from realities with budgets, but sometimes it's impossible. So, what do we say to those kids, well, or do we say anything? Well, I, you know, I, th I thought about that on the drive over today. Uh, I thought about what it was like when I was in whatever grade I was in. Not, I didn't recognize the challenges. It was, it was what it was. I didn't know the school was any different last year. I didn't expect it to be any different next year. I didn't know I was poor growing up, yeah. but I was. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought it was going. To, I thought this was the way it was going to be forever, and it, it and it was that way before. So I don't know that the kids, because in in response to some sort of challenges, the kids will do what the kids are asked to do, given the right resources, which includes the parents saying to them. You can, you will do this, uh, and the teachers expecting it to be done, uh, and the administration backing up the teachers. Do you feel like, as a school board member, do you feel like uh, you know it's it's um? Do you feel like all the constituent groups are coming at it from the same direction, but that but that things are getting in the way, or do different groups have different ideas about 
how this should work. I think different groups have different ideas. And, and this comes not just from my experience at the Board of Education. This comes from 31 years in the classroom and seeing how the attitude of people have changed over those, over those years. Uh, the attitude of parents changed over those years. Uh, it, it used to be that the, the parents backed up the teachers all the time. Toward the end of my career, <laughs> it was definitely not that way. Uh, kids will be kids. They're always going to try to get away with doing the least amount possible <laughs> or getting away with doing the most stuff they're not supposed to do. Uh, My son would beg to differ. Well, that's a good <laughs> point. Exactly. He's 10. He's 10. Uh, it, it, the problem comes when parents start backing up the, the child and the administration backs up the, the parents. Uh, it, makes, it makes teaching rather difficult. Well, Tom, Tom, let me respond to that sort of in a general kind of way. That the truth of the matter is that whether the world's moving more quickly now than it did 30 or 40 years ago or not, I don't, I don't know. But it has the feel of moving faster with higher expectations, less time to do things, more, more things that are expected of teachers, students, parents, citizens. I think you're exactly right that parents seem to be supporting their kids more at the expense of not supporting teachers. But the, the advent of the smartphone and the tablet and the computer and the internet has, has changed the world and has changed the world of education for good or evil depending upon how it's used. And I think kids in the second grade want rules as badly now as they wanted rules as mm -hmm. second graders a hundred years ago. But schools are constantly under an attack of one kind or another, a lawsuit of one kind or another. My child was bullied, or my child whatever. I mean, there, there, are, there's, there are. I think the hardest job in the world, besides being a teacher, is being a building principal. Where you, it, you're the lowest rung on the ladder, and everything flows downhill to you, and then you let it flow down to the classroom teacher. So all these expectations that the world has now created for public schools find are, are, are finding a place to land where there's in, it goes right back to insufficient funding, lack of parental support, and the list goes on. I guess the point I'm trying to make is. There are a thousand reasons why schools are suffering today. Chief among them is financing. Chief among them is lack of parental support. And they're, they're all chiefs. They're all number ones. And I don't think we know what makes a quality public school in Johnson County, Kansas, different than one in Sedgwick County or Shawnee County or Douglas County or, or you pick a county out of the 105. There's a lot of commonality, kind of going back to the original question, but the because those kids all need the same things, no matter which county they live in. But I think as a society, we're so divided on how much we should spend for that, on what we should expect as proof that our kids are doing well and we're getting good value for the money we spend. It's, it's an incredibly complicated issue, and when Representative Rooker in, in that legislative process is asked to make decisions in many, many ways on the fly yeah. about what's the right, four in the morning. What's yeah. the right vote you know, in the 14th day past when you should be home, yeah. um, it, it's that lack of strategic planning, or as a friend of mine used to say, strategery, strategery. <laughs> that, that has produced some pretty poor public policy. And, and unless you've got a, a, a stream of a, a strategy of getting from A to B, we're just going to continue to sort of struggle. Well, let me circle around to a question Marcus asked a little while ago. Around this table, I, I believe we probably all want to get there to that end goal, right? Successfully preparing our kids to launch into the adult world. But some of the folks that are guiding the policy discussions have a very different end goal, and that is to cut income taxes to zero. 
with education taking the, the chunk out of the budget that education takes, the only way to sustain those tax cuts is to shrink the size of the education footprint on the state budget. That is a very different goal than yes. okay. what we are discussing here today, which is how we best prepare our kids. That, that takes all of those issues out of the equation. It's probably what drives people who don't understand why our schools have to have certain programs and, and funding to pay for them. <clears throat> so I, I think that that is a very real part of this discussion. Well, Steve Anderson was quoted in the paper a couple of days ago was saying the reason it's very critical of the Brownback administration, they call them incompetent and some other things, but he said the reason it didn't work is they didn't cut taxes enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, Lord. I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, how many millions a month do we need to be short of the budgeted uh, the budget in order to have? Steve Anderson has also very publicly come out in support of the voucher system, mm -hmm. so specifically mm -hmm. for the, the Catholic diocese, which, which has been which has been um, in large part throughout the nation. And I come from Florida originally, and, and vouchers were a big part of that. Um, and and as time has gone on, we we found that. You know, mismanagement of those systems is is you know apparent, and well, and that should be something yeah, we, we think about. Yeah, and the bills that that have run, whether they passed or not, the bills that have been presented during my three years in, in the legislature, have not had any accountability. Right. So it's in one way or another, it is using state tax dollars, whether it's a tax credit or you know this or that. It's at heart, it's state tax money being put into private entities that have none of the same requirements to account to the state for the, the performance, for the use of the funding. And so I get accused... Or even the students they serve. Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. Um, I get accused of trying to protect the status quo, nothing of the kind, but I do believe that we need to have an honest discussion about... Equity, right? Right. But how do these? If, if everybody says they they like their local school, they like their local teachers, how do how do people like this get elected? How do they how do they find this voice in the legislature? Uh, is it just the desire to lower the taxes and everything mm -hmm. else? Is, it, is the campaigns have become very dishonest affairs. So what gets said back home in the district and what gets put on the record when a vote is cast can be very different things. So everybody goes home and says they're pro-education, but it, it's it's trying to unpack what that means to different people and, and through their voting record where the value lies. And there are some terrific organizations in this state who are doing that work. Um, some have to remain nonpartisan, so they don't take sides. They simply say, this is the bill, this is the impact it has, and here are those who voted yay and those who voted nay. Uh, it's a little obtuse. There are other groups that do a better job of connecting the dots because they're free to do so and, and say, you know, don't like the size of your child's classroom, your representative voted this, this way. way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a matter of helping people become better consumers of information. And there's no magic bullet. I've found it takes one on one conversations. It's labor intensive, but the more groups that are out there engaged in that, the, the better off we'll be. So, so you all have brought up this idea that I want to touch on just for a second. It, it occurs to me that when I was a child, I'm, I'm, I just turned 45, um, when I was a child of the 80s and 70s, um, you know, in my household we had television that we got over the air, a landline phone, and a water bill. That was about it. Now we have multiple cell phone bills, internet connections, devices, so on and so forth. These are all costs, household costs, but they also speak to this idea of inter interconnectivity that, that I think, David, you mentioned. Um, and so you had, um, uh, Melissa Rooker, you had mentioned that, you know, this kind of shift on educational focus towards this, you know, away from the test, more to the soft skills. Um, but it occurs to me that in that discussion, one of the things we have to really think about is that the kids that we're teaching today 
they interact with their world very differently than we did. And they interact very differently, I think, than the kinds of people that came to the Department of Education, you know, listening to her and, and gave their opinions. The opinions came back that we want our kids to look like us. And, and I'm not sure that that's not correct. It probably is correct. We want them to have those soft skills. But I think it may have, um, you know, without, without going out and really looking at the kids that we serve and, and how they live their lives, you know, maybe we're missing something there. I would have liked to have seen, we want that future Kansan not to look like a baby boomer or a Gen Xer, but we want them to look like someone who's prepared to live in the world that they're going to lead. Well, I think that speaks to teaching our children how to apply knowledge at heart. If you don't know how to apply these lessons you're learning, I can rattle off those linking verbs. I also know how <laughs> to use them, right? Right. And I know that it, 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 so it's deeper than that, more sophisticated than that. Teaching our kids, that is that critical thinking piece, how you apply knowledge. So if you've got, my son is pre-med and, and hopes to become a surgeon. He can't just memorize the facts. He's got to be able to translate that into a, a more intuitive sense of how you know these part these symptoms are all making present. judgment Absolutely. at the top of the and so it those you know it, it, having good judgment mm -hmm. good good that that foundation that to me is the direction we need to go because I don't think it matters what the world of technology looks like or, or what are, our backgrounds our kids come from, any, any of them have to be able to navigate the world by applying the, the knowledge that we propose to teach them. You, you were talking a moment ago about cell phones and computers and all the rest of that. There's a lot more noise today. Yeah. I'm not sure there's a lot more quality information that's available. And there's a lot more, well, you go back to what you said about if you had a a phone bill and a water bill and an electric bill. You didn't have cable TV, you didn't have an internet bill, you didn't have a cell phone bill. So every household that's 21st century somehow feels the need to have all these things. So they're spending several hundred dollars a month more to provide more noise, but maybe not to provide any more real analytical skills with which they can use the information that they, they can acquire. So that economic pressure on a family is not good for having a family that is together more as a family. Right. I mean, they may have nice toys, but they may not spend, ever sit down for dinner together. And the, the, that, that kind of traditional, myth, I'm going to call it a mytholo myth, mythological family, really does serve a, a quality purpose. I'm not sure it ever really existed. The Cleavers... You know, that really was just yeah, pure mythology. Yeah, television show. But, although they lived next door to me, but um, <laughs> and we threw stuff at them or whatever. Right. But um, the, the debate about public schools is so intertwined with the debate about what we're going to be as a society, you can't pull them apart as ideas. And schools, the money spent on schools, kind of go back to something Representative Rooker said, there's this huge pot of money out there. And the private sector sees that as a target. Mm -hmm. And baby, would they like their piece of it. Mm -hmm. And if they can open a charter or get a voucher, that's just all the better. And somehow they think they're going to provide a better quality product and still make a profit. Well, well we, we have this okay argument here. about the, how much we spend on administrative costs in our public schools. How about how much the CEOs of these private charter companies earn? It's right. millions of right. dollars right. As, as opposed to a couple hundred thousand dollars. Well, and they talk, they talk about these charters in terms of, of giving parents some kind of a choice. And, and it occurs to me, I, I was at a committee hearing two years ago when we had a charter group come in and give a presentation. And, you know, they talked about the, the lack of profit that they make. But oddly enough, the guy giving the presentation was the CEO of the company that ran the charter school. Um, but when you go back to this choice idea, you know, who's giving the, ch is that, is that for-profit charter going to, going to end up in rural Kansas somewhere? Mm -hmm. Are those parents going to, going to get that kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, choice? Choice that, 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 already exists in Kansas. We allow 
for we provide the public school system we allow private schools we allow our private school operators to choose whether to follow the accreditation path or not they can be religious based they can be whatever they want to be there's certain things if they want to be accredited that that we ask of them but the choice exists to be either or. We allow for homeschooling. We allow for virtual education. Choice already exists. It's all through the auspices of the public education, the, the Department of Education, and that's the piece of it that, that these folks want to do away with. They want to take Department of Ed out and um, allow these private operators to, to do their thing at taxpayer expense. Well, and, and I think at student expense, because ultimately, you know, just speaking for my own family and my own children, I, I don't want my kids to be a profit center. I don't want my mm -hmm. kids to be profited from. I want them to profit from what they learn as they grow older. But, you know, I, I just... And we know from the other states where this has been the, the, the protocol for years, it... it increases the segregation it increases the income disparity and it, it it puts more intense pressure on the system itself because it it skims off the the easiest to educate and leaves our public schools with with those kids that inherently cost more and my um, question is how do you how, how do you fight that it, it strikes me that what's been going on in the state of kansas uh has been uh a sort of divide and conquer. They've tried to, tried to do is, is pit groups against each other. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers against school boards, teachers against administrators, KNEA versus KASB. Uh, and it, it seems that uh, it has worked in some way because these people have, these people who believe that the profit motive is the way to go in the public school seem to be winning. That's why the elections expense. matter. That's why elections matter. And when 18% of the eligible voting population is all that we get for an August primary election, there are consequences to that. And if there is one takeaway from this kind of series, my message has to do with turning out the vote because it matters. It very clearly matters, and it impacts and, our kids. And you have government officials doing everything they can to discourage people Absolutely. from voting. Make it scary. Make it complicated. Make it as hard as possible. Keep the turnout down and keep the status quo of decision makers in the Capitol building. That's right. It, it also concerns me is, is that the kids in high school don't see the value of being involved in the political process. I, mean, I know a lot of schools have these programs where you have to volunteer, you have to do some sort of community service. But these kids aren't doing the community service in the political realm. They aren't going out and helping with campaigns. They aren't helping go door to door. They aren't even stuffing envelopes. They're cleaning up the park, which is a great thing <laughs> to do, but it's not teaching them anything about the political process. In fact, many of them don't, many of them see public service as simply that volunteering. And they don't see anything connecting that to politics. I think we have to reverse that trend in order to have a decent future, have a, a good middle class future. That sounds reasonable. And, and you know, you're right. I mean, I see it in, in the district, again, where my kids go, that, that, like you just said, public service seems to be let's, let's clean up the park, let's, you know, which are good things. Those aren't bad things. But, um, you know, maybe there's a, there, there should be a space for, for something larger. Okay, so we have just a few minutes left. This has been a great discussion, and I really appreciate, you know, kind of in this pilot episode of this, this has been fantastic. So I'm going to kind of do this little, you know, we're kind of trying things out here. So I'm going to try something here and, and, and blindside you with a couple things. <laughs> I, I, I've gotten, a, I pulled a couple quotes from some folks um, and I'm going to read the quote, and I'm going to ask the panelists to kind of respond to the quote a little bit, okay? So, so here's the first quote, and I'm not going to tell you who it's from, um, at least initially, um, but you all can probably guess. So um, here's the first quote. We should listen to those who are closest to our students, their teachers. What do you think about that? Uh, that's, the, that's the group I listen seems to. Obvious. Yeah, it seems obvious. It, mm -hmm. it seems that it always struck me that you can elect a school board who can hire a superintendent who can who can build buildings and fill out all kinds of things and all kinds of people, but until you have a teacher in that building, you don't have a school. Right. They are they are the critical they are the critical piece that makes everything run. I, to me, it, it really spoke to the teaching and learning relationship. 
an acknowledgement of the, the inextricable nature of the teaching and learning relationship. You can't have a strong learner without a strong teacher. I mean, and it's, it's, it's that simple. Okay, so, so that was Governor Brownback at his State of the State address two years ago. He, he, that's a quote from him. And so, you know, um, you know, trying to think about these quotes. Here's another one um, that I pulled. You can walk, this is more recent. You can walk into any school and talk to the janitor, and I can tell you who the best teacher is. They all know. What do you think about that? It, 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 it's the classic example of people value anecdotes. If we have a we have public policy in that state house made by anecdote, and it frustrates me no end because they're not factual. There's some one I was going to say something else. There, there's someone's thin, simple view of the world drafted into an anecdote which serves as the basis for our public policy making. It's disgraceful. Yeah. Uh, and speaks to why it is such a, a, a why our teachers feel that the climate they're operating in is so hostile. And you, you can't succeed when when you're feeling that kind of stress. Under attack. As a former teacher, I believe that knowing and having a good relationship with the custodian is very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any teacher will tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, I, but I don't know that they're the person I'd go to to figure out whether they thought I was doing a good job. No, not. it's a true discount of everything yeah. going on in the classroom. And that quote kind of you know came from this this idea that's going to be floated here on merit pay, which is a whole different show. Um, but but you know, I just wanted to get some response. So here's a little longer quote, and I'll, I'll tell you who this is from as we go here. For my part, I desire to see the time when education, and by its means morality, sobriety, enterprise, and industry, shall become much more general than at present, and should be gratified to have it in my power to contribute something to the advancement of any measure which might have a tendency to accelerate the happy. So this, this is like a person who didn't founders. graduate from high school. No, that sounds like one of our founding fathers. Yeah, or Thomas Mann or John Dewey or somebody. Essentially, it, the way I read it, it talks about the fact that education is, is kind of the key to, to your lifelong happiness. Madison. It, <laughs> I like it. We're, we're quiz showing. We're, we're trying to figure out who it is. It's <laughs> it, 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 I think it also speaks to the idea of the what we used to call the liberal arts education. We, we talked about, uh, about training, about how training has fallen back on the schools as opposed to uh, businesses. Uh, whereas schools used to be about what we now refer to as the simple as the liberal arts education. We seem to have gotten away from that, I think much to our regret. Uh, I think, because I think about the, the thing about the liberal arts education is it taught people how to think critically, how to work cooperatively. Well, the, the um, study that showed that the most of the Fortune 500 CEOs are English majors. Right. Right? I mean, the, it matters. To, I've been an English be major. To... I'm not a Fortune 500. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> Correlation is not common. That's right. It's right? not <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Touche. Uh, well, I, I think Abe Lincoln would, would agree. That was that was a quote from, from Honest Abe. Okay. And then we've got two more, and we've got just a couple more minutes. So, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Very idealistic. What do you think about that? So, so to me, we're talking about not stifling that dream that kids have. What do you think? Let's see. I would say Kennedy or like Martin Kennedy. Luther King. Uh, you know, it's great to be aspirational, but where the rubber meets the road is how the society works together and supports the reality of the day-to-day. -day. You can't reach that aspirational goal unless you have some foundation, and that's the value of public schools. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of been the topic. We've, we've been dancing around. We, we started with this idea of common ground, but you know, Stephanie, I think, started with this idea of what, what the value is, and we've, we've really been talking about that in terms of the resources, the funding, and all the things that we need to have strong public schools. Okay, last one in just a couple minutes. Who was that? Oh, I'm sorry. That was Harriet Tubman. Oh, wow. Harriet Tubman. That was my second guess. Pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll just skip that. Um, the next one. I do not believe in a fate that will fall on us no matter what we do. I do believe in a fate that will fall on us if we do nothing. It's a fatalist view. I mean, an anti-fatalist view. Mm -hmm. It's it's a view that it says we do have control over our destiny mm -hmm. in some way. It would, but it it doesn't 
it doesn't discount the idea of, of people winning the birth lottery. You can you can have all these Certainly. things uh, given to you, but if you don't do something with it, uh, <laughs> and our choices matter, right? Our choices do matter. That, yes. that, to me, that's what that speaks to. And, and and in the context of this conversation, I would hope that you know we go back to this idea that we want kids. We want at least you know when as a teacher, I wanted my students to choose education. I wanted them, I used to tell them, you know, knowledge is power. Um, you know, it's, it, it's the key that unlocks every door. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that I think that's really important. So um, that was Ronald Reagan, by the way. And, and that was from a speech on education. So each, each one of these was. So I think we're just a couple minutes away from what we said was going to be our end. But since, again, this is kind of a, a freewheeling podcast show, I think that's a good place to end it. So I'm going to say to Melissa Ricker, to Tom Brungard, to David Shawner, and to uh, Stephanie Harson, who has, has left to attend another meeting, thank you so much. You've really helped me out with this, this first one to, to have a panel to have a panel discussion today since we had a couple back out on us. They were sick. We hope they're feeling better now. Um, and we'll do this again in a month, third Tuesday next month. Thank you all so much. Thank you.